Hi, Ben here from the North American Guitar. We're not in the showroom, as you can see. We are currently in Phoenix, Arizona, in the USA. Uh, super excited. We're here for a few days uh, to spend with Jason Costal at Costal Guitars HQ. Um, I've never been to Costal Guitars, and I've never been to Phoenix, so we're gonna go and check out his workshop, do a little tour, and talk about some of the phenomenal instruments that we've got incoming to North American Guitar next year. Costal Guitars, here we go. Ah! Welcome to Costa <laughs> Guitars. Good to see you. Good to see you. Wow, wow, look at this. Yeah. We're here. Here it is. Oh my god! <laughs> it's a surreal moment. Here we are. Just taking it in. So, we're here. Um, just tell me, how long have you actually been here for? I've been here since 2011. So moved in right after I left Irvin's. Yeah. Um, took me a lot longer to get the shop up and running than I thought. And you know, it's interesting. I talk to people that have been woodworkers for thirty years and they're still adjusting yeah. their shops and stuff. So and there's always some kind of changes going on. But for the most part, I feel really happy being in here. I feel comfortable with it, and it's a neat work environment. But I'll show you. Let's go. Kind of how how it works. Oh wow! This is surreal. So this is what I kind of refer to as the main milling area. Yeah. Um, this room is the larger equipment. It's where I bring billets of wood in and really take them down to a usable, manageable size. On the walls, you see jigs and fixtures, which are things that we use in woodworking to replicate a process. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started out, everything that I did was a one-off. You know, yeah. my, my first 10 guitars yeah, yeah. were all different. You know, the headstock's a little different, whatever. And, as you start to refine your build process, you say, okay, this is how I want it to look and I want to do it the same each way. So because I'm not automated with CNC, jigs and fixtures are woodworking techniques that allow me to replicate the process and have consistency in my yeah. builds. And you know what you see is a lot of templates to lay things out, orient the wood, orient braces, whatever, and then other things that I use to, to help me control a router, drill a hole, Things like that. So it's, it's really a fascinating way to build. Um, it also allows me to increase my efficiency yeah. because I don't have to stop and measure where I want to put the braces every single time. It's, you know, there's kind of a set place that I've determined works for me. So it seems like not a big deal, but when you start to really set up your process, you suddenly save yourself inordinate amounts of time mm -hmm. that you know, all the, and all this mental energy that you were using a lot before. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you, you know, just saying, okay, I have you know a center line on a piece of wood. Let me draw that line. Let me double and triple check fifteen times mm -hmm. that it's centered. Then you know, draw a line perpendicular to that. It has to be this width and everything else. Now every piece of wood has two registration holes that I draw into it that align the center point. And everything, I just stop it on there, you know, draw the line, life is good, move on. Wow. I, I save myself probably weeks of, of labor by being a little bit more set up like this. So, And how long, I mean, how much time would you say you spend here on a daily basis? That's a crazy question, but do you have like a strict working hour? Because I know that yeah. we spoke yeah. before and mm -hmm. you've... You know, might have been preparing for a show or something like that, and you've literally been oh, like two or three hours sleep. Yeah. sleep. Yeah. Um, Do you try to have a very fixed, like nine to five I, schedule? I have a, at, a, at a minimum, I work nine to five. Right. That's that's minimum, no matter what. Um, typically, we put in a little bit more time. Um, I actually feel most comfortable working in the middle of the night. Yeah. I think mostly because then the phone isn't going to ring. Yeah. There's no interruptions. And the world seems a little calmer, like everybody else is sound asleep, you know, in the world so I can open the windows and let the cool air in and things like that. So yeah. I, I adjust my work schedule a little bit, but what I try to do right now is work um, usually around 50 to 60 hours in a week. Mm -hmm. And then what I typically do is, is, you know, kind of set up my schedule according to that. And it, it works very well for me. So. Um, but this is kind of, you know, when I'm starting something, this is kind of the main area that I, that I come into and I start to work the wood and, and bring it down to this, the pieces that I'm going to turn into guitars. Oh, I can't wait to see the wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so surreal being here. I mean, seeing so many videos that 
A, you've done for us, right, right here on this <laughs> table, yeah. and, you know, just the, being on the phone, Skyping, yeah. it's, it's... There's no props, it's, it's like a fully it's functional amazing. workshop, this it's, isn't like a movie set, you know? Yeah, it's really um, amazing. This is probably the room I spend most of my time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a big room, it doesn't feel very... Uh, clustered and, and like close you feel like you have room to move around yeah so I like working in here especially when you start to handle guitars you're always worried that you're gonna like turn around oh, and snap yeah, into yeah, something yeah. so I try to set it up so that there's not a lot high up and not a lot close to where you are that you could bang things into mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but this is where I spend a lot of my time and you know if you kind of look around you've got clamps of all different sizes and, and shapes you've got uh, laminate trimmers routers um, you know there's three different band saws here I, I use this one over here for my daily use I do pretty much everything on this one yeah the Italian built Laguna has a, a more powerful motor than the regular Lagunas do and I've got a really big diamond blade on there for resign this is for like ebony mahogany and big pieces of wood mm -hmm. And then this band saw over here is I make all my own binding and stuff like that, and I have that set up to just kind of do one procedure. What you find in my shop, um, again, it's kind of a Jim Olson concept of if you set up a tool and it does one procedure, you don't have to set that tool up over and over yeah. and over again. When I got started, I couldn't afford a ton of tools, so I had like one router. Well, if you have 400 tasks mm -hmm. that that one router has to do, you're constantly changing out bits, changing the depth, you know, and you start to realize I'm doing a task that takes a minute and a half, but I'm spending 25 minutes setting up to do that minute and a half task. So what Jim taught me was, hey, if you get multiple routers and you set up one router to do one thing, I can walk over to that router, do the task at hand. I don't have to double check, does it have the right bit? Is yeah. it the right depth? You do the task, you put the router back and you move on. And now that minute and a half task takes me a minute and a half, yeah. maybe two minutes. Yeah. So you start to save you know, time and energy. And what I try to do is I, I try to maximize efficiency, but you can't do it in a way that, that is a detriment to your quality control you know, and the craftsmanship that you're doing. So the way that I've found time and the way that I've created time is by managing each procedure and finding out what's the most efficient way to do it where I get the result that I want without diminishing the quality of it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. So when you look around, there's a lot of, you know, kind of different things where it, it, it's a tab, or like a machine or a tool that does one thing and it works very well. The, the organization is beautiful. I mean, you can, I can feel that military background. Yeah, the organization is important to me. Yeah. Um, mostly because... Truly for, again, for efficiency. Well, well it's, it, that's exactly what it is. You know, if I, if I use a tool, and I'm finished with the tool and I come over here and I set it down. An hour later when I need that tool again, I have to try to remember where did I set it. Mm -hmm. and, and you can look for it for hours and that's just a huge time waste. So I know where to go to, have, to get the tool and when I'm done using it, I put it back. And it just means I don't have to utilize a lot of mental energy to figure out where stuff is. I know exactly where it is at all times. You could ask me right now, where is this tool? And I can tell you where it is in the shop without even thinking about it. So, you know, that works. And organization is important too because, as well as the cleanliness of the shop, I think, you know, there's dust. It's clearly a usable shop, but people come in and they go, wow, it's really clean. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people is I believe that if you have a clean work environment, it promotes clean work. If your whole entire work environment looks like a 10-year-old boy's room, yeah. then you start to think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I can set the guitar here. I can do this. And you start to cause issues yeah. throughout the process. Unnecessary issues. Yeah. So just quickly, did you do, just with like bindings and things like that, uh -huh. did you do, do you batch, do those in batches? Of course. Just, just get yeah. all prepped and... Yep. Yeah, and, and I'll show you that kind of as we go into the wood room and, and walk around, but um, that's another thing where, you know, if I make one set of binding, well, just to glue up the perf lane and the binding and cut it, it takes, you know, maybe an hour, hour and a half, whatever. Um, and so if I'm going to do that, why not? And, and you have to thickness sand them. So, you know, in the beginning, I would do it for like the guitar that yeah. I'm working on. Yeah. Well, you're like, okay, it's 20 minutes each time I build a guitar. But if I just go, hey, today I'm going to do binding for all the guitars that I'm building this year, and it's still 20 to 30, maybe it's 30 minutes of work, 
but it's for every single guitar. Mm -hmm. So now I've done 30 minutes for a batch of guitars as opposed to 20 minutes for one guitar. So it sometimes when you do the work, you feel like, oh, I'm making this a little bit longer than yeah. need to. But when you divide it out amongst all the, the jobs that you're yeah. doing, it's a huge... It and and, and if, if it wasn't a lot of time, I wouldn't focus on it. But when I sat down and evaluated my process, I ended up saving, and I'm not even joking, about two and a half months. That Because one task that takes half an hour, multiply it by number of guitars you're doing, suddenly you're at, well, there's 12 or 15 hours just in that one task. Yeah, there's crazy. 390 tasks in building one of my guitars. So when you start to find ways to save you know, time in each of those, and then you multiply that by the number of times you're mm -hmm. going to do it in a year, you suddenly are like, it's days, it's weeks, yeah. it's months. And then you can go, well, now I can put more guitars in, or I can take time off for myself. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about it, but as I, I've tried to find the work-life balance, yeah, and I'm taking so time off for myself yeah. now, and there's this perception that if you take time off, you're not working, which I guess is theoretically true, and that's why it takes so long to do this. But what I've found is I've doubled my output since I started taking time off for myself. So I'm working more efficiently, I'm working smarter, not harder, yeah. and I'm making maximum use of the time that I have. I add a couple hours into the day-to-day -day work day because I don't care if I'm working at night, you know, or whatever, it's not a big deal. But it means when I take time off, I can actually enjoy myself. And the reality is, is I'm getting a lot done in a shorter period of time, and I feel very good about that. That's brilliant, that, yeah. I, I would have, Love to have been a sort of fly on the wall watching you go through that time efficiency yeah. with every single task because that must have been a monumental thing to, to well, do. But at the end of it, you must have been like, wow. Well, there's, is... there's two parts to it. There's the part where you do it on paper. Yeah. You know, and you're like, oh, according to this piece of paper, mm -hmm. here's where all my time is, right? But like, according to this piece of paper, I'm super wealthy. Or, you know, I mean, there's paper, like when you do something on paper, you can be like, okay, according to the numbers, here's where I'm at. But then, you do it in reality and you're like, ah, it's not as easy as mm -hmm. you think. So the first thing was figuring all this stuff out mm -hmm. and coming up with a plan, but then I still had to execute it and I still had to make it work and everything else. So there is, there was some, you know, significant emotional events as I started to work through that. But now, you know, with time you get to where you're, you're pretty happy with it. Amazing. Um, just yeah, kind of some other things in the room that are interesting. This is a, just a thickness sander. Yeah. Um, the, the marble slab, you'll see those throughout the shop, they're just trued and flat, so it gives me a laboratory grade flat surface to double check straight edges and things like that. Um, a lot of edge sanders and stuff like that. Uh, but mostly, again, it's wide open space, feels very comfortable. It feels very, yeah. There's very go bars throughout the shop. Um, I tend to try to work on four guitars at a time. Mm -hmm. So everything that I have, I have it set up to do four things. So there's four go bars, so I can be working on four tops or four backs. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just seems to work well for me. There's some drill presses over here. You know, one is just kind of a main drill press. Uh, you've got one that has a sanding drum on it, and I use that because sometimes you don't want to use a router because of the grain of the wood. Mm -hmm. And then I have a rosette cutter that's just a series of blades that cuts kind of the same size rosette every time. If we come over here to, uh, to the bar. <laughs> yeah, I know, the bar. Um, this is kind of an important area. This area really serves two, two purposes. One is it's storage, yeah. and the other is sharpening. Yeah. Um, I, you'll see in a little bit when I show you kind of the tool room, I'm a fanatic about hand tools. and. It's interesting because when I got started in guitar building, I could not use hand tools. I had never learned, never had a reason to learn, and so I liked power tools because they were easy, they were you know, quick to learn. What I learned at Irvin's is that if you have a well-sharpened hand tool, you can do better work more precisely and oftentimes more safely than you can with a power tool. So I do a lot of my cutting, slicing, beveling, whatever, with chisels, with planes, but the result, or in order to do that, I have to have a really sharp blade. And so I have a multitude of sharpening systems, as well as what I think are some of the best sharpening stones in the world, the Shapton stones. Um, these go from 220 grit all the way to 30,000 grit. Wow. Um, and you can literally sharpen a, a chisel beyond your wildest imagination. 
the sharper it is, the safer it is, because now you're not pushing the tool through the wood, you're just letting the tool do its work. So I spend a lot of time here sharpening. I've set up the systems. Again, you know, we talked about, I talked about earlier about having multiple systems. So like the work sharp is one of those things where I like to have different grits. And when I first started using it, I had one. So you have to, you know, you're changing out the platens yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. doing one chisel and you're going, okay, this grit, now a new one, now a new one, now a new one. And it just took up a lot of time. And what I've found is that if it takes a lot of time for me, I'm less prone to wanting to sharpen the tool. Right. So I figured out methods through other woodworkers where I could do it very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so now I use a, a, ch a chisel and when it starts to get dull, I come over here and it's like, okay, coarse, you know, medium, fine, extra fine, and in 15 to 20 seconds, that chisel is yeah, yeah. where I want it to be, Amazing. and I go back to work. And then if I really need to go, you know, these are like one micron or, you know, thousand, you know, grits that, that you know, you can polish it and, and everything else. So when I need something that's really, really sharp, I have other tools that I can use to get there, or I can use the stones. But for general, everyday use, I go to about a, you know, 1500 grit on, on these tools, and it's a sharp edge that works well for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then I resharpen. That is incredible. So, um, it makes total logical sense to yeah. have different and it's, ones there, yeah, and, and, and you can, and rather you than need that. every time changing it. Yeah. yeah, and you don't need that. Yeah, I mean, you know, when people are like, oh, I want to become a woodworker or a guitar maker, and you know, you see a shop like mine or somebody else's, you could be overwhelmed by how much stuff there is. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people is, you know, technically you can be an auto mechanic with a wrench and a drill, yeah. but what's the quality of work that you're going to do? So the more equipment you have, the more tools you have, you start to be able to do something better. Yeah. And, and that's really what this is all about. So I started with, you know, I didn't have all this stuff when I started, but as I've gotten, you know, a little further along in my career, you spend the money on, on other equipment or better equipment so you can do the job. All, all, yeah. all, all for that efficiency. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so just talk us briefly about uh, some of these. So these are the templates that yeah. I use, and they're, they do they serve two purposes. One is just to be able to look at a piece of wood, and because they're see-through, you know, I can I can grab this template and I can set it on the wood. It has a center line, two drill bushings, and I just set it there, and I can move this around and figure out. Oh, you know, here's a knot here. So if I move it so the waist is here, the knot's outside of the, the perimeter of the guitar. So you line up how you want the guitar to look on the wood, and then you drill these two holes, which now reference your center line. And everything that I do from that step forward references off of those two holes right. and until the box is complete. And I have, you know, here's a drilling template for my headstock. And this is so that every single you know, a tuner hole is in the right location. And then I have jigs in the other room that reference off the tuner holes and help me profile the headstock. So I never have a headstock where like one tuner hole is yeah, over here yeah. and one's up there and things like that. So it's all just about, again, kind of figuring out your methodology. These are, are laser cut by a friend of mine, so they're accurate to within about a thousandth to two thousandths of an inch. If I break one, I call them up and say, make me another one. Yeah, great. When I got started, I was making all these by hand. And so the reality is, is that some of them were a little wonky. Like maybe they weren't totally flat or smooth or whatever. And um, if I broke it, like, oh, I spent <laughs> three days making that thing over again. And now it's just a phone call and you know, it gets delivered and life is good. So um, you can't complain. And then you know, over here, you asked me about the binding. You know, so here I, I basically have bent binding for multiple guitars. I have it set up by a model. And when it comes time to bind a guitar, I walk over here, grab four pieces of binding. It's already pre-bent to the shape I, I want. And I glue the binding on. And, you know, a bunch of straight edge measuring tools. Um, and that's really what happens in here. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Is it time for the, we're going to say the wood room for last? No, yeah, we'll, we'll save the wood room for Save the wood room for love. We're going to go to the tool room. Oh, wow. So, this is where I spend most of my time. 
any detail work that I'm doing on the guitar is going to be done in this room. And um, there's a certain level of comfort for me in this room because it's kind of a smaller room. The workbench is right in front of me. There's no distractions and every tool is within reach. And so when I'm working on the guitar, this is where I like to work at it. Um, I have two kind of two workbenches so I can kind of work on two different things simultaneously or I can be working here and I can move things out of the way. Um, I design these benches. This is kind of a cool idea in my opinion and, and I'm very proud of it. But you have a, a cork retaining wall here that allows me to push the body here to work on it if I'm scraping and things like that. Yeah, but I, the, remember, I remember yeah. us talking about this ages ago. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but the, the wall is it's forward of the tools. Behind here is a, a ledge that's below the height of the table with cork on the bottom. So if any tool falls off this wall, yeah. it falls behind the bench and lands on a cork platen, so, so you're not damaging, damaging the tool. Yeah, and because it's lower than the bench, it's not gonna fall over onto the table. So I've protected all of my work and everything's kind of right here and accessible, but I don't have to worry about a tool falling off, landing on a guitar and causing a significant emotional event. Yeah. Um, but you can see there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of chisels, there's scalpels, there's micro chisels. Um, saws, tuners, kind of everything that you could possibly imagine wow. right here. And this is, you know, where I say I'd probably do about 40 to 50 percent of the guitar building is just kind of right at these two benches. Um, around the room, it's really just a lot of storage. You know, yeah. there's, I, I think people don't always realize how much goes into building a guitar. Everything from just like, do I have wood screws to screw something into the wall and hang it? Do I have, you know, this or that? You know, there's a lot of sandpaper. Um, just a lot of registration pins, drill bushings, things like that. I have strings. These are kind of the main strings that I use, so I keep those readily accessible. And then down in some of the, the different uh, drawers, I have hundreds of other brands of strings. So if somebody's like, I, I like, like these, Alexia, I like these, I like yeah, or you put them on and, it's, and you're ready to go. Um, but again, you know, a lot of sorts, some little um, dremels for doing inlay work or bridge type stuff. And you know, it really is kind of well thought out, well set up. Um, it's got a lovely feel. The, the, so so far, from what I've, I've sensed, it's, it's got a really lovely feeling in this workshop. Yeah. Very relaxed. Very, you know, meticulously organised as you would expect. Um, I spend a lot of time in here. Yeah. And so you want it to feel comfortable. You want yeah. it to feel like. You know, I, I don't want to come down here and be anxious, and I don't want to come down here and be like, oh, I wish the work day was over. You know, I love what I do, and and I think if I have an environment that I feel comfortable in, I'm excited to come, you know, come in here and work, and that that's a positive thing. There's not many people in the world that can say that, you know, that they love going to work, they enjoy being there, and it's hard to get you to, to leave at the end of the day, but that's how I feel, and this room and the, the shop itself is part of that. I'm very proud of it. You know, I... I it's one of those things like you look back on your life and and um, I never took out a loan I never you know borrowed money from people I started with you know very small like what equipment I could afford I built a guitar I sold it I took that money I put it into more equipment and so part of it when I look around this shop I think of the journey you know this is um, quite literally uh, about 12 years well really about 14 years in the making and, um, you know, it's easy sometimes, like, you look around and think, wow, you've got all this stuff. But, like, it, this didn't happen in one day. It wasn't like I woke up and I'm like, let me just access my account <laughs> and, and write a check. So um, it is something I'm very proud of. You know, there's a lot of people that I know, my peers, who have smaller shops, and they do incredible work in it, and that's an amazing thing. I, I like space. I don't like to feel confined and things like that. So... Um, I do feel very fortunate that in this shop, um, I, I feel I feel like I have the room and the yeah. space to do the good work. And, and you can be in a different mindset when you're working on a different part of you know, part of the project. Yeah. Uh, in different rooms. So that's and cool. and one of the things that I really learned from Michael Greenfield, you know, his shop, in yeah. my opinion, is yeah. probably the most beautiful it's, shop in the whole planet. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. immaculate. And yeah. but what he really taught me is. 
you know, he has that chef mentality. Oh, yeah. And, and the, the chef mentality of the mise en place, which is like, let me get all of the stuff ready before I do the task. And then let me set up the kitchen so that this is the saute section. This is the cutting area. This is the grilling area, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And because I love to cook and he and I connect in that way, seeing his shop for the first time really resonated with me because he was like, this is where I bend sides. This is where I do my rosettes. This mm -hmm. is where I carve my neck. And in other shops that I've worked in or, or when I've had my own shop, it was like everything was kind of scattered. Like, well, today I'm going to carve the neck here. Tomorrow I'll go carve the neck over there, you know. And I, I started to realize that if you do certain tasks in certain areas, you can have all of your tools for that task right there. Mm. So you're not doing a job in here and walking out there to get the tool. The tool's right here in front mm. of you. And when I started to do that, it started to just feel, you know, really comfortable, really efficient. And I like that. So, you know, every task that I do is done in a very specific place in the shop. And I just go to that place every time. Mm. And I've set it up so that, like, oh, I need that tool. And it's right here within reach. Or it's right up here on the wall. And there, I don't have to sit there and be like, well, gee, I wonder where that is. And let me go find yeah. it. You and know? also, you, you, you're breaking that concentration, aren't you? Yeah. You, if you're working on, a, again, a very, very detailed part of a rosette or whatever, mm -hmm. and if you, if you've, oh, where, where did I put that? Oh, yeah, it's next door. You know, you've broken that laser focus that yeah. you would have had at that particular time. And the other part, too, is that sensory-wise, it keeps you interested. Because cool. think of, like, working in a cubicle where you're like, my entire day is staring at this computer. If I had a really small workshop with one workbench, you know, this is my view for the entire workday. And I think if that's the case, you start to, you know, you start, oh man, I'm kind of tired and I don't really want to be here. I may work here for an hour. Then I go back into the other room and I work there for two hours. Then I go into the other room for an hour. Then I come mm -hmm. back here. Mm -hmm. So you're moving around and I think each time you move, your brain kind of resets. Yeah and you get that kind of new energy, you feel mm -hmm. refreshed because you're now in a different environment. Mm -hmm. And I, it works very well for me. And of course, this is where you're, you're bending all your sides. Yep. Yeah, Yeah. so I, um, I use the LMI benders. I, um, it's just one of those things, you know, these are variants of the Fox bender um, that was created by Charles Fox. And it's an incredibly great system. One of the issues with the early Fox benders is we just use kind of a rheostat and you never knew how hot it was. Yeah. And and when I taught at Roberto Van, like we actually had students that like their sides would literally start on fire. Because <laughs> the way the Rio set worked is it just kept getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So if they forgot about it or we called a demo and they left and nobody was watching it, the, the 200 degrees got to be 300, got to be 500, and all of a sudden the resins ignite. Wow. And you're like, what's that smoke in your <laughs> you know, and somebody's guitar is on fire. Um, when LMI decided to come up with this system, they added a closed loop rheostat with a temperature control. Right. So before I was like, hmm, I wonder what temperature I bend at. Who knows? It's about here on that sliding. <laughs> now I can say, you know, I bend the waist at 360. I bend the lower, upper and lower about at 300. I drop it to 260, bake it for 15 minutes. And the nice thing is I also have timers set up to it. So literally I put it on and if I get on a phone call or I end up doing some other task, these things shut off and I don't have to worry about burning the wood. You know, I don't worry about setting things on fire anymore, but I do worry about burning it if it cooks too long or mm -hmm. something. And so this is a really kind of, um, thing, you know, it's an easy thing that I can do where I can forget about it. Um, and then I'll let it sit in the bender for the day as it cools off and kind of retains its shape. So it really does work well. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. So it, it, it's time. Let's go. Let's go into the wood room. Oh, I see boxes. <laughs> I see teen eggs. <laughs> so this room wow. is really just storage. Um, there's a huge amount of material and, and obviously money invested in this, so it's important to, to protect it. And this room stays temperature and humidity controlled. I'm fortunate in that my whole shop stays the same temperature yeah. and humidity year-round yeah. very easily. 
a lot of other people fight that, so what they do is they set up a room that's protected, knowing that the work environment may not be. So at the end of each day, they have to bring their work into that humidity-controlled environment for storage. My whole shop is acclimated, but I still like having a room that I can protect and maintain and take care of. And the way that I have it set up, you know, behind you, these are pretty much tops. I have every kind of top you can imagine. I primarily build with German spruce. Yeah. I, it, I've been using it for years. I buy it specifically from a, a person in Germany. And the logs that I'm getting that he's cutting down, I know exactly where they come from to a, an eight digit grid coordinate. So it's not like, hmm, I wonder if it came from here or whatever. Um, I have every other top imaginable, but really that's kind of the primary focus. I have brace stock um, up above is kind of storage. We as builders are kind of wood hoarders. Yeah. So if somebody brings you a deal, it may be a wood you don't intend to ever use and you don't think you're ever gonna use it, but you're like, I can't pass up the deal, <laughs> so I'll buy it. And then you get home and you're like, what am I gonna do with this? Yeah. But then what's funny is there are times where I think to myself, like, man, I just wish I had this piece of Oh, I think I do. So this is like my Christmas section where like when I go through it, it always is like, you know, Christmas morning where you're like, I didn't know I had that, but that's great. Um, there's kind of a storage area behind me, uh, neck blanks. I use all single piece neck blanks. So a lot of people do the laminate or the, the two piece neck blank glued together. There's nothing wrong with it. It actually is very rigid, very strong. Um, I just like the look of a solid piece of wood. Yeah. Um, it just seems to work well for me and I also feel like you're taking away one glue joint that could potentially fail or, yeah. or you know if you have any issues um, bridge blanks fingerboards head cap material braces neck blanks um, here's all the binding you know that I've made over here some purfling up above what I have is kind of what's on on deck for next year okay you know and things like that so it's kind of everything has kind of this mobile process I like to acclimate the wood for a couple years so yeah. all the wood is in here as I get ready to build for you know like in January of this year all of the material for next year went up here all the material for this year made its way down and into this baker's rack right. which you know every guitar has its own you know rack and that's where the sides top and back go and as they start to be manipulated as rims are formed, the rims go up above on the shelf or stay in the mold down below like mm -hmm. you see. As the top and back get glued on, then they either go into this bin or onto the rack over here. Okay. The, the racking behind you is backs and sides, and then you know the sides are against the wall, the backs are all here. And um, it's really just trying to stay, like you said before, organized, um, know where everything is, be able to protect the wood. So. This it's is beautiful. just a great room. Yeah. It's a great room. And it just, with, with, is it just the stiffness of German that you like so much? or, or? No, it's, um, in all honesty, it's, you know, when people come to me, they're asking me to be a subject matter expert mm -hmm. in what I do. You know, I, I'm not an expert, you know, but, but they, they're asking me to be, and the only way I can do that is by increasing the amount of information and knowledge that I have that I can basically share with them. One of the issues I have with a lot of spruces is while the genus and species is the same, it may come from totally different areas. You can get Sitka spruce from different areas. We get European spruce, and we don't know if it's from Switzerland, Croatia, um, it, you know, it, it's, it can come from all over. And the altitude that it grew in, the growing season, everything else, you can have 10 pieces of wood that are all the same genus and species, and they handle and, and are, their responsivity is completely different. Mm -hmm. So with German spruce, the reason I use it um, is I, I get it from one person who's a, a kind of a friend of mine and cuts down wood for the violin industry and doesn't sell publicly or anything like that, but it allows me to go to him and every single billet that I'm getting is coming from his backyard. Yeah, amazing. So whether it's this tree or this tree, the growing season was the same, yeah. the altitude was the same. So I'm getting wood that's very consistent for me, which means my ability to understand it and then get the tone out of it that I want is a lot easier than if I'm blindly buying wood from different vendors 
and saying, well, it says it's all Sitka or it's mm -hmm. all this, mm -hmm. but you're feeling, you're going, well, this one's really stiff. This one's kind of floppy. This one weighs, you know, has a different density. And I just feel like what I am able to give to my clients is that expertise of knowing the wood that I use knowing and knowing how exactly how it, it is, knowing it. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and then there's the added fact that, like, you know, Jeff Traugott pretty much only builds with German spruce, so I kind of felt like, well, if that's his wood of choice, yeah. I can't go wrong with it, you know. <laughs> but all the other woods are incredible tone woods. Yeah. It's just, um, I feel very comfortable with spruce. I've had a lot of people say, will you build me a cedar guitar, a redwood guitar? It's not that I can't. You know, I have knowledge and, and experience, but conceptually, like, I haven't ever built a redwood top guitar. So I can feel it and flex it and say, okay, I need to thickness sand it a little bit more, or I need to do this. But there are people out there that build only with redwood, and so they have a lot more knowledge about that wood than I do. And so I'm just always hesitant to, to go down that path and say, yeah, let me, let me experiment with your guitar. Because if it doesn't turn out right, then I feel like I've failed. So I try to stick with what I know, and if somebody is like, this is really what I want, um, I'm more prone, instead of saying, okay, let me just do it, I'm more prone to send them to somebody that I think does it really well. well. Because at the end of the day, I want them to have a guitar that they're yeah, happy with. Yeah. And I think part of what makes someone good at something is knowing your own limitations and being very honest about them. There are things that I do very, very well. There are things that I don't do well. And the things that I don't do well, there are other people that do them very, very well. And I have absolutely no problem sending somebody, you know, not, I'm not just saying like, go away, I'm going to find the right person for them because that's part of this community and that journey, mm -hmm. but, you know, knowing what I do well and what I don't do well is important to me because I want everybody that gets one of my guitars to be an ambassador to my brand absolutely. and feel good about it. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So, uh, you know, basically, that's the shop. You know, this is where I spend all my time. Um, I've got, uh, well, you, you know, asked about these, these yeah, I know. This some is... rosette material. Wow. Um, you know, all of these are dyed and stabilized and really, you it's know, you spell, can, right? Yeah, yeah, you can create some amazing color schemes. You know, you see the chatoyants and kind of the, the, you know, the different way that the light reflects off of it. And uh, it's just fun to play with these, you know, play with different colors, different dyes. Um, some so of these experiment and just I do, and yeah. some of them are you finish and you're like, wow, it turned black. You know, like <laughs> I, I mean, there are epic failures with this, and then there's some. I there's one rosette that I did on the set of four uh, Brazilian guitars that I oh, did a couple years ago. Yeah, that rosette to this day, everybody is like, I want that rosette, and that rosette was a complete <laughs> like mistake. Like I I had like thrown different colors in there. Things went really wrong. I started to change what I was doing, and I was like, "Well, we'll just see how it pans out." And it came out. And to this day, people are like, "I want that rosette." I'm like, "I, I'll do my best to replicate it." But you know, um, but it's just cool. I, you know, a lot of people have amazing things that they do. You know, you think of like a Michi Matsuda, and his expression comes from all this craftsmanship. And really, my philosophy on the build is I want to use the finest wood available in the entire world and let the woods of the back and the sides and the top really be the showcase of the guitar. And then I use the color of the rosette to just give people something to look at that's exciting and different. And so when I have some really vibrant colors, I love using them because, you know, it kind of stops you in your tracks and, and makes it look cool. So, you know, some fun things going on. But this is basically where I work every day. And um, like I said, I love what I do. I feel very fortunate to be able to do it. You know, there's so many people out there that have really helped me along the way. I definitely didn't do it on my own. And people like you at TMAG and clients that have taken a risk with me and, and continue to come back for more. You know, I feel very fortunate and very grateful to be what I'm doing at this time in my life. And it's you know a true pleasure and honor to have you out here to come visit me. I know it's quite a journey to come from. Surreal, me. it's surreal. Um, it really is. But thank you, you know, for coming out to the shop. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's just. It's incredibly clean. Amazingly organized. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I'll say it again. It's amazing. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. Oh, here you go. <laughs>
Okay. Wow, that was just so surreal and uh, such a humbling experience to see um, a true kind of master in his environment. Um, I, I mean, we obviously we spent a lot longer down there. We've gone through sets of wood and we've looked at boxes that are in build and. But just listening to Jason and how articulate he is about his organisation and his processes, it's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And to, to be a part of that um, from, from our side, from this little shop in London representing him and his um, phenomenal instruments is uh, yeah, incredibly humbling experience. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the shop tour. Um, uh, for more information on the finest hand-built luthier instruments and please do subscribe to our channel um, and for more information on costal guitars then please do get in touch. <laughs>